turn your Bibles to Titus chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. As we continue in our study, God's plan for women in the home. And this is now part 3 of our study. Titus chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Please don't forget that this is Paul's counsel to Titus. And Titus is to minister to the older women. And the older women are the ones directly ministering to the younger women. And this is what the Apostle Paul said in verses 4 and 5. And so, train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Now, we're continuing in our focus on uh, God's plan for the younger women. And on, uh, based on verses 4 and 5 of Titus 2, we find seven duties of women in the home. And uh, this is what we find in verse 4 and 5. Again, look at these things. The, duty number one. Just a quick review. Duty number one, women are to love their husbands. And the Greek word here for love implies the love of friendship. The wife should love her husband affectionately. Duty number two, love their children. Mothers should also show their affection for, show affection for their children. And that's what we would call tender loving care. Uh, but I also would like to remind us that we're not talking about spoiling our children. But love should always be controlled or guided by God's Word. And to put it in different terms, parents, or particularly mothers, should not fail to discipline their children when they need to be disciplined, especially when they're younger, uh, in the use of the rod of discipline. They should believe that this is what the Bible teaches. They must trust that because this is the instrument that God has uh, commended in order to discipline our children, we must not be afraid to use the rod of discipline if we have to. So uh, we must believe that this is part of God's or this is part of loving children, not just giving everything that they want, but uh, giving them what they need. If they need discipline, we must give it to them. Duty number three, to be self-controlled. And this means to be in control of one's mind, emotions, uh, so that they may make sound judgment, they may think right, they may have the right priorities. Last time, I gave a focus on two aspects. Women are to be controlled in the use of time and in their use of money. Okay, number, duty number four, they are to be pure. Women should be careful about their thought life. Women should repent from any sinful, I'm sorry, sinful daydreaming, sexual fantasies, and uh, self-gratification. Mag-ingat sila. And this is often the temptation of women who feel that their husbands are not loving, their husbands are not leading in the home. And so uh, because of that, they are imagining to be uh, in the arms of a man who's more loving, more gentle, more understanding, more affectionate, more uh, involved in the lives of their children. And this can eventually lead, lead to sexual immorality or to adultery. So women are reminded here to be pure, be careful regarding how your thoughts go. Okay, duty number five, working at home. Uh, I've given much emphasis to this and there's a tendency uh, because of my understanding of human nature, people have a tendency to forget. And this is something that I just need to keep on repeating again and again until, until uh, one begin, begins to realize, oh, so this is, this is what it means. Uh, let me remind you what uh, one biblical counselor, a female biblical counselor said in relation to this. Her name, Martha Peace. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, the title of her book uh, where this quotation comes from is The Excellent Wife. And this is what she says. The biblical concept of a worker at home is not a popular one today. Again, I read this before, but I'm just repeating it again so that we can remember this. But I do believe, says Martha Peace, that God intended for the women, especially the younger women, 
to stay home and do a good job of caring for their homes and for their families. And then she adds, if a wife is working or is thinking of returning to work, she's working outside of the home, she should examine her motives. What is it that she really wants? What is her heart set on? Is it more material things? Is it wanting to be out from under the demands of child care? These are some of the questions she should ask. None of these motives are for the glory of God. They are self-serving and sinful. Godly motives would be learning to be content. Philippians 4.11 Gratitude to the Lord for what she does have. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 And whatever you do, in thought, word, and deed, do all for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 Staying at home and organizing a clean, well-run household is a major biblical emphasis in the God-given ministry of the wife. Now that is so contrary to the world's point of view, but that is what the Bible teaches. Now in addition to that, the Apostle Paul says, in, as his sixth duty to women, is for them to be kind. Now, being kind is a very good virtue to add to being workers at home because it's possible for women to be so busy at home or uh, to be doing other things. Maybe they're ambitious and they're, they're thinking of just uh, climbing the corporate ladder or doing things that are not biblical. And, and for them to lose, uh, to, to lose their being kind towards others. And what's really nice regarding uh, the word kind here is that in one sense, the Greek word means to be a nice person to be around. And so this is a reminder for women who are so absorbed maybe in their homes, doing household chores and other things, uh, being very busy, that they should not fail to be uh, this kind of a person. They should remain uh, being kind. They should, be, they should be winsome. They should be nice persons to be around. They should not be grumblers, complainers, or uh, women who are easily irritated, easily get angry. No, they should be kind. But kindness also could include uh, women who think of the needs of others and goes out of her way to meet those needs. That's also kindness. Now, there are some women who may be saying as their slogan, charity begins at home. But in practice, what they're really saying is charity begins and ends at home. So they're no longer extending help to others who do not belong to the immediate members of their households. They're not opening their homes for hospitality anymore. But that's wrong. The Apostle Paul said they are to be kind. And then the last duty that we find here in verses 4 and 5 is that wives are to be submissive to their own husbands. Last time, we started looking at the acronym SUBMIT. And for every letter, S-U-B-M-I-T, there's a, there's a principle that I shared. And we're going to look at that again today. Uh, just wait for a few moments. But before looking at it today, we'll, we'll continue in what, we've, uh, what I've mentioned already, uh, the S and the U last Sunday. I'll review that for a moment and then continue on with the B-M-I-T. But before doing so, uh, I'd like to read to you some insights from Ellis Fitzpatrick, another very good female counselor. And she's a biblical counselor. She's the author of the book, Helper by Design. And it's subtitled, that book is subtitled, God's Perfect Plan for Women in Marriage. And in that particular book, in one chapter, she explains and she clarifies what submission is. In fact, uh, she started with a negative. What submission is not. And so before looking at the details of submission, as we've started last week, let's first look at the negative again for some clarification. What submission is not. Here are the four points that she shares regarding this. Number one, submission is not only for wives. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood. 
You've been hearing from me, submission, wives should submit to their husbands, etc. And you may, get, you may get the impression, is submission only for wives? No. When you go to Scripture, you will discover that submission is actually for everybody in this sense. Turn, for example, to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Very specifically, you find the Apostle Paul saying, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. However, when you read the verse just before Ephesians 5.22, when you read Ephesians 5.21, this is what it says, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is a reminder that submission is not just for women. Men and women in the Lord must learn to submit to the authorities that God has placed over their lives. For example, in the work area, God didn't say only women should submit. In the work area, in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 to 8, reading verse 5, it says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ." The Apostle Paul did not say, female slaves, submit to your masters. No, this is submission by uh, male or female slaves. In the family, yes, specifically, the Apostle, Paul, the Apostle Paul said that wives are to submit to their husbands. But he also says in chapter 6 of Ephesians and verse 1, that children are to obey their parents in the Lord. Whether those children are uh, female or male, they are to submit to their parents. In the church, the Bible says that both uh, men and women should submit to the appointed leaders in the church. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. The Apostle Paul didn't say only the women should submit to their leaders. No, the implication here is men and women in the church are to submit to their pastors, to their elders. And the reason the Apostle Paul, uh, the, the, uh, the, the author of Hebrews says that, the, the, that uh, members are to submit to their leaders is because these leaders will one day give an account. Tatanungin ng Panginoon, O, oh, Jurem, kumusta itong mga tupa na pinaalagaan ko sa'yo? Ano na nangyari sa kanila? Inalagaan mo ba sila? O ano na nangyari kay ganito? Dito sa babaeng ito, ano na nangyari sa kanya? Hindi pwedeng sabihin ko, ay Lord, hindi ko alam. I will give an account. So I need to know who are the people submitted to me. Who are the people who have said and who have made a covenant with me together with the others and say, ikaw ang magiging pastor namin. Ikaw ang magiging pastor ko. Ang aking kaluluwa, pinapaalagaan ko sa iyo dahil ikaw ang overseer na nilagay ng Panginoon Diyos sa aking buhay. And if you've done that, that's why we've formalized our church membership. That's the reason why meron tayong church membership covenant para na maliwanag sa akin, alam ko, sino ba talaga yung dapat kong alagaan ng mga tupa? Sino yung nagsabi, they are going to submit to me. Mananagot ako sa kanilang mga kaluluwa. Okay, so that's submission, both female and male. In the area of government, in, the, in, in society, it's the same thing. It's not just the women who are required to submit to government, but men as well. Sabi ng uh, Romans chapter 13, verse 1 says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. And ultimately, our submission, all of those who claim to be Christians, we are to be submitted to Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24, it says that the church submits to Christ. So as you, as you can see, submission is not just something that God has slapped on women. Hindi ito sa babae lang. Even Jesus Christ Himself willingly submitted to ungodly authorities as part of His ultimate submission to the Father's will. Okay, now look at the second clarification regarding what submission is not. Submission doesn't mean that wives are inferior to their husbands. Submission doesn't mean that wives are inferior to their husbands. 
The Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. When it comes to our standing before God, there is no distinction between men and women. Men and women are equally created in the image and likeness of God. They are equally fallen, and they are equally in need of salvation. Submission is not a matter of who is smarter or who is most deserving. Hindi yun eh. Pag nire-require ng Panginoon submission, He's not saying, well, men are of a, they, they have a more complete person than women. Women are second-class citizens. That's why they should submit. No, it's not that thing. Hindi yun. We're equal in the eyes of God, but in every institution, there is order. Naglagay ang Panginoon Diyos ng order. As I mentioned a while ago, in, in society, may order. The people submit to civil authorities. In the church, the members of the congregation submit to the elders or the leaders of the church. In the home, children submit to their parents. Wives submit to husbands. Merong order. Okay, sa lahat ng aspeto ng society natin, may kita natin, may hierarchy, may order, but it doesn't mean that the person you're submitting to is of a higher quality of person compared to yours. That's not right. It's just like the Trinity. And this is actually the foundation of this teaching regarding submission. Jesus Christ is equal to the Father in terms of deity. Jesus Christ is 100% God. Jesus Christ is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. Jesus Christ is eternal. Just as the Father is omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, and eternal. However, we find in Scripture also regarding the eternal submission of Jesus Christ to the Father.